Good evening and welcome here tonight to this next hour with the company of Penn Vogler, the author of the absolutely magnificent new book, Scott. Um, I'm sitting here in London, having just been told that we've gone into tier three. And so my literally only restaurant booking of the entire year, which was on Wednesday night, has gone out the window, which is very sad. But I have to say, it is more than compensated for with the prospect of an hour in Penn's company to discuss this really magnificent book about British food, but in particular about how class and food have collided and created the thing we know as British cuisine. Penn is a superstar in the food world. She wrote Dinner with Mr. Darcy, Dinner with Dickens, as well as curating a fantastic exhibition called Food, Glorious Food at the Dickens Museum. And she's even, in days gone by, sadly not when we're in the middle of COVID, she's hosted Dickensian dinners for numbers of five by 15 regulars who've been lucky enough to come. She's a familiar face on TV and a familiar name in the press. And I think tomorrow she's on Woman's Hour, which is also really exciting. Now, Scoff, um, I've got it here in my hands, but I just want to show you the wonderfully beautiful end papers of the book. Scoff is out now, I think it's probably the best Christmas present I know for anyone. I have been curled up by the fire reading it for the last week or so. It is full of extraordinary facts and figures and stories. And I'm really pleased to say that Newham Books, who are our lovely partner, have got some signed editions if you want to go online. And the details of all of that, Penn's book plus Newham Books, will be online now. And I'd also like to just say a quick thank you to Marlow Wines, who have partnered with us and helped spread the word. And they send uh, wine to anywhere you are with some of the best wine labels you have ever seen. Say no more. Anyway, Penn is going to chat for a bit about Christmas food and where it comes from, what it is, what we eat, why we eat, what we eat. And then she and I are going to talk and then it'll be over to you all. And thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, Penn looks extremely Christmassy behind her, uh, which is very nice to see. I look less Christmassy, but that's not to say that I'm not feeling slightly Christmassy. So please put questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. So Penn, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And um, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be able to sit back and listen to you tell us a Christmas story. So Rosie, thank you so much. Um, I feel I'm probably the color of your curtains <laughs> from that beautiful and very, very generous introduction. Um, I want to talk a bit about why we eat what we eat, starting with why we eat what we eat at Christmas. And I'll just start with a reminiscence because that's incredibly important for all of us. I, it's about turkey because on our Christmas tables, turkey is the kind of sun king, isn't it? It's the thing that everything sort of revolves around. And um, I don't like it very much. I find it a bit dry, I find it a bit boring. I remember trying to inch my, my family into having something else and I asked my mum I said could we have something different and she said go and ask your dad so I said to my dad not can we have something different but what do you, what would you like for Christmas thinking he might say oh some beef or some goose or something and he just said I expect we shall have turkey case closed and and I was thinking why do we expect to have turkey every Christmas? Why have we got ourselves into this interesting situation where nearly everybody tries to sit down and have the same thing? It doesn't happen in Britain on any of the other 364 days of the year. And one of the things I do in my book, or the prime thing I try and do in my book, is to figure out why we eat what we eat on any other day of the year as well as Christmas specifically as you, as you said in your introduction about how class and social class and, and our, our idea of kind of where we sit in the hierarchy, where that influences, what's on our table, how we eat it, who we eat it with, what's in our shopping baskets. And so it's all those things. It's, um, it's the way we've kind of manipulated each other, the way we judge each other, the way we've kind of um, tried to sort of move up the social scale using food and dinners and the way we eat as a kind of social kind of ballast. But just going back to Christmas, 
And I suppose this is a question I wanted to ask this year more than any, which is why, why do we have this massive meaty feast in the middle of the winter? I mean, particularly now when it's going to be really difficult for us all to get together and having a huge family, even enough people to kind of eat some kind of, you know, Himalayan bulk of a turkey is going to be difficult. And I think the answer goes back a very long way and it's a very, very long tradition that we have all our kind of most meaty feasts in at the end of December, because before we learn to keep livestock going over the winter, so I'm talking sort of medieval and Tudor times really, we had to slaughter most of our livestock in November and in December, because we were competing with them for available grain to eat over the winter. And so basically, you, we were in competition, there just wasn't enough food to go around. So instead of having all our lovely summer, you know, having a lovely summer festival or something for Christmas, we've chosen, deliberately chosen this year, this time of year, when we need to eat up the fresh meat. And a lot of the traditional things on our Christmas tables, things like pork pies, mm -hmm. come from, and, you know, come from, and, and ham come from, that's when you have the with the pork pie it's the last of your fresh pork meat the ham obviously is the first of your of your kind of salted meat for example and so we have this very very meaty feast in the middle of um winter when all your or livestock and or if you are kind of at the top of the kind of food hierarchy, not just your livestock, but your game, particularly, you know, wild birds, venison, um, venison was the kind of uber posh food, right up to the present day, where it now has this kind of very interesting state that we can talk about. And, um, and so the kind of meat you had has always been really, really indicative of where you sort of fit into that kind of social hierarchy. If you had um, land and a game park or a grouse moor, you would have game, but venison game wasn't something that you could just buy in a supermarket, uh, not a supermarket, I'm talking about, you couldn't buy it in a shop, you couldn't buy it in a butcher's shop. And there was this term up till quite recently actually, which was butcher's meat, mm -hmm. meaning meat that you got through a farmyard, you know, um, and you needed to have a deer park or you needed to know somebody at a deer park to eat venison. And that's why it was always the kind of the grandest, the poshest. And what you'd have with it, uh, and I'm sure probably a lot of people have heard of this, is you'd have a, a potage, which would be a kind of sauce thickened with maybe breadcrumbs or some kind of grain and spiced and with fruit and, you know, dried fruit and maybe orange and lemon and all the rest of it. And if that sounds a bit like Christmas pudding or bread sauce, it very much is. So it kind of separated out over time and the bread sauce stayed as the bread sauce and all the other stuff got kind of put into the Christmas pudding when some genius invented or discovered that if you greased a cloth, floured it, poured the stuff into it, wrapped it all up, you've got this nice, round, what Dickens calls a round cannonball. And that's where our kind of Christmas pudding Ooh. comes from. And so you have this kind of great hierarchy of game and then right at the bottom, if you're a poor, you know, a poor person, you, you get what you get, basically. You hope that your the farmer or your, la the, your landlord or the lord of the manor, you hope that somebody who is in some kind of position of responsibility gives you something to eat, uh, you know, for your kind of Christmas table. And one of the interesting things that happened in about 1524 is that we got this new thing called a turkey, uh, which was brought into Britain by a trader called William Strickland. And he brought in turkeys. We don't really know how, but we know that it became part of his coat of arms. So it almost certainly was him. And it, was, it came in at an interesting kind of position really because it wasn't game. It was described by um, a cookbook writer in the early 17th century as a lesser landfowl 
It was described by a farmer called Thomas Tusser in the late 16th century as um, the turkey, as one of the Christmas things, something you'd have at Christmas with shred pies of the best, he describes it, and shred pies are probably mince pies. And Turkey comes in this really interesting time when um, there was a lot of massively growing population, <coughs> a growing middle class population. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, not really enough meat to go round. So it comes as a really good time, actually, in this kind of growing European uh, population. And it gets quite quickly adapted onto, not onto the kind of, it, obviously people at the top of society will eat any kind of meat, you know, but it's not seen as their kind of identifying thing. It's, it gets put onto the farmer's table, the yeoman's table, the kind of smaller landowners, and that's where it has its status. But it's not something that poor people would get to eat. So, I'm going to kind of do a really quick whiz through a few hundred years. Uh, I just want to say something about the Puritans and Christmas because their attitude, I think, is really, really interesting. If you look at in the prism of the whole of our kind of the last thousand years that I'm thinking about in terms of, uh, you know, food and social class and the way people have tried to manipulate other people, because the Puritans were very down on Christmas and partly because of the you know, lux luxury of very wealthy people, but I just feel they got their propaganda wrong because they were really down on the poor people celebrating Christmas with what they call, um, there was a, this a Puritan news sheet called the Flying Eagle of 1652 and, it said, and whoever wrote it said, the poor will pawn all the clothes of their back to provide Christmas pies for their bellies and the broth of Ooh. abominable things in their vessels. And so that broth or broth or abominable things is probably the, you know, the, um, the potage that we were talking about that kind of becomes pudding. And, um, and they were doing what so many people have done is they're saying, okay, you poor people, you should not waste your money on this kind of luxury. And we've said it to poor people about tea, about white bread, about gin, about all kinds of things. And it's a real, you know, it, it's something we can talk about later, but it's so interesting that it's come from so many different perspectives of society about, you know, what is good for people to eat. Um, and so I'm gonna jump ahead now a bit to the beginning of the 19th century and just look ahead. I know, I know we've been talking about Turkey, but in the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, there was a sort of range of food that people would be eating around Christmas. Christmas pies were described and were, could be anything. There's this incredible Hannah Glass recipe, 1747 recipe for Christmas pie, Yorkshire Christmas pie. And it's that whole thing where you have like the turkey and the goose and the duck and the partridge and something else and something else you know and then you put it all in a pie and you put some jointed hairs around it and you cook it for 24 hours or something you know um but a christmas pie could also be a mince pie usually with meat you'd have brawn even jane austen who's we think of as quite posh talks about brawn and christmas pies on the side for christmas and brawn is uh, kind of made from the sounds it sounds slightly revolting to us, but the face meats of a pig. Mm. But it was a great treat. People loved it. Um, venison, we've talked about. Um, roast beef was the kind of, was the real, uh, it was the really iconic British thing that people had. It was what the yeoman had, what the kind of middle classes had. It was what you had if you were British. But it was also what you gave to... Um, to people in a kind of charitable sense. So if you were with the Lord Mayor or you were, you know, a kind of an aristocrat or if you were the king or something celebrating a jubilee, you'd have a huge ox roast and you'd give out slices of roast meat, roast beef and um, plum pudding as well. So those two things kind of come, go together constantly in the sort of image of, a, of sort of celebratory 
and charitable and very British food. And then you'd have goose if you're slightly poorer. Um, you pay into a goose club at the beginning of the 19th century uh, if you were poor, often in urban areas, and you get back goose. like a Christmas club, and then at the yeah. end, you get your goose back. Um, you'd have ham, like we do now, you'd have pickled pork. Um, you'd have a 12th cake on 12th night, great big fruit cake. And as I said earlier, if you were poor, you had what you could get. You might have a rabbit or, you know, a, you know, a bullock's heart or something. And what happens in, uh, in the kind of 1840s is that partly, I think, down to the famous Dickens story of the Christmas Carol, is we start anchoring these two things to Christmas Day, the turkey and the, the plum pudding. And if you remember a Christmas Carol, Scrooge, mm. um, the, the Cratchit family, when they're poor, they're about to have a goose. And then Scrooge, when he becomes reformed, he brings them a turkey. He brings them that kind of big, solid, generous, middle-class thing. And um, there's a very nice quote, actually, from uh, Mrs. Beaton. And she says, and this is not much later, this is 1861. She says, a Christmas dinner with the middle classes of this empire would scarcely be a Christmas dinner without its turkey. So she's still seeing it as a very kind of just a middle class thing. And then the other thing, of course, that help gets anchored to this day is the plum pudding. And again, if you look through a Christmas carol, you won't see a Christmas pudding anywhere in a Christmas carol. You'll only see this made plum pudding. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not until two years later when Eliza Acton, who's this completely brilliant cookery writer, predecessor of Elizabeth, um, of Mrs. Beaton, um, she puts in a recipe for Christmas pudding in her book. And so you start getting this extraordinary event. And the more I think about it, the more extraordinary I find it. Whereas everything else in our food lives in Britain is stratified, you know, the kind of food you have, the kind of cake you have, what you call it, when you eat, the dinner, you know, your dinner hour, whether you call it tea, or whether you call it a scone or a scone, you know, do you drink claret or do you drink, you know, Lucas A, do you have monster munch, do you have an arctic roll, whatever, okay. all these things place you really, really firmly on a kind of higher, a kind of hierarchy. And yet we have managed to decide as a nation that we're all going to have or we're all going to aspire to this same dinner, this turkey, this kind of Sun King turkey, you know, with its kind of um, satellites of sprouts and bread sauce and cranberry sauce and pigs in blankets and just all those other things. And I find, um, although I don't like turkey that much, I actually find it quite extraordinary and quite hopeful, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ped. That's fantastic. I hadn't really thought until, you know, you, you, you talked about it, this idea that it's got this, this great levelling capacity that we all eat turkey. Because, I mean, the other great thing I'd never really thought about was, you know, just how much class does affect what we eat. And I think before we, we come to questions, and please do start putting questions in, I'd love to just ask you, because this is obviously a Christmas like no other, and let's talk at the end about a few recipes and things that you could do if you haven't got a crowd because of course the turkey whole point of a turkey is that it's gigantic or potentially gigantic um but this the question with class is it, it's very it, it, it's a great way of excluding people isn't it posh food and i mean from everything from the way i mean curiously in uh, the weekend there was a piece about a person you could hire to help you set your table and it struck me as sort of one of the most extraordinary things that, you know, you have all this thing of rows of knives and forks and what you do with it. And if anything ever sends out a message of, well, you're not good enough or you're not you know, correct enough. Yes. Yeah. The paraphernalia around food is extraordinarily powerful. It reminds me that Peeps, Samuel Peeps, paid, found a man who could fold napkins really beautifully. And he paid him a huge sum, something like 40 shillings or something, to teach his wife how to fold napkins because he was 
very much, you know, the coming man. He really, he was a kind of middle class intellectual who wanted to kind of join a, you know, a class above him. He was very interesting. So I think it's been happening, for, it has been happening for a long time. Um, that use of kind of food and the paraphernalia around food to kind of make that statement. And I think it's true about, we love the idea that food brings us together and it does, but I think we have sort of atomized it in a way so that food brings this set of people together so they can identify themselves against this set of people. And so it does bring us together, but in, in kind of layers in a way. Yes, I, was, I mean, there, there are many examples that, that tell you that story. I was particularly interested in, I mean, just the idea of the picnic, which is something that all social classes have, but there is a very big difference between the kind of romantic picnic or the Glyndebourne picnic, or the picnic, and you have a wonderful line about someone having a picnic beside their car, which of course yeah. tells you a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny because, um, it's, it's also writing this book made me totally kind of question all my assumptions about, you know, the kind of the right way of doing things. And I realized that they are not the right way of doing things. They're just what I've learned. But, you know, came from this kind of middle class family. We love to go for a walk and we go for as far as we could away from other people and have our picnic on a kind of remote hillside. And looking back you realize that actually that's a very specific way of having a picnic and it's a very and it's something that the probably if you wanted to pin it down to one person at one time it's Wordsworth in the Lake District starting to eat in a particular way um, that celebrates his relationship to the land and a lot of people kind of middle class intellectuals who have been sort of picked up and you know who deracinated a little bit I suppose gone to the cities they've lost that contact with the land they're very very like us now thinking about how to kind of reforge a link to the food that we eat to the land you know that we um th that we know that that food comes from and we do it through kind of farmers markets mm -hmm. we do it through walking or whatever and the romantics did it through picnics and uh and, and walking as well and so if your idea of a picnic is to kind of have this kind of like quite remote and probably quite uncomfortable picnic, then that's where that idea comes from. Whereas the aristocratic idea of a picnic is to have, be next to your horse and your carriage or next to your car or something and be served by somebody if you can, yeah, have somebody to, you know, and have the whole wicker basket thing. And then there's a sort of, and then historically, then you have this idea that, that um, there was a lot of anxiety historically about picnic or about eating in the open air because that's what workers did, you know. So that's what field workers did. That's what um, what agricultural mm -hmm. workers did. And every and it's so interesting. The language around it is so interesting because if you're an agricultural worker, you call your food, you call it. Uh, victuals or bavoir or beaver or you call it snap if you're not notting a show minor you would never ever call it a picnic even though it might be just bread and cheese and a cornish pasty and you know whatever um and so yes i mean you can be eating the same thing but the language you use around it is incredibly important and and also again you know where where you choose to do it and how you choose to kind of identify yourself and but, but the whole thing about staying ahead, that's what really moved what we eat, isn't it? You have a quote, I think, from Escoffier saying, you know, if it wasn't for class, we'd never eat a new food. So it's, it's an invention that keeps you in a privileged space, isn't it? I mean, you, yes, you quote I mean, like the Peach Melba, for instance. Or... Yeah. Yes, yes. Every, there's this, it is Escoffier and he says, um, he says, you know, this desire for novelty is killing me. He said, I'm in my kitchen, you know, at midnight trying to find something new and I should be in bed and my, I should be at rest and my bones are exhausted. And it's the, you know, it's the, it's my clients who are sh shouting novelty, 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 that's what we want. Um, and they want novelty because they want to show that they have the status that kind of novelty brings. 
and then um, and so usually quite often what happens with food is you get a new food or a new type of food that you know an escoffier is expensive because an escoffier has come up with it and then it gets imitated mm -hmm. um, by people you know aspiring to belong to that kind of that trend setting aristocratic or kind of high higher class um, and those so those people move on to something else and that thing moves down the kind of social scale and so the peach melba thing is really interesting because it starts off as peach melba and it has an ice one and you know it's all very but it's a, a dessert designed for the soprano she australian wasn't she soprano nelly melba and it is very you know it's fresh peaches and a kind of raspberry whatever it is and it kind of gets adopted and slowly all the ice you know you lose all the trappings of it you lose the ice swan the fresh peaches become tinned peaches it just becomes normal ice cream and then I had it as a kid you know it's just like we called it peach melba but you know you know I'm sure it was quite different from the um from the original version and a lot of foods like that kind of come out that ice cream particularly it's very it's so expensive so difficult to make and technology obviously and inventions all play their part but things do kind of slip down a scale and so is, is it about money or is it about the complexity of the dish or just about somebody having the idea of putting two rather strange flavors together and coming up with a, a new thing it's about so many different things. I mean, I think one of the things that was interesting for me in writing the book was that every different food stuff has its own story, you know. So the avocado and the potato and the tomato all have similar stories, but they're all quite different, you know. So it's not really about money. It's a lot about um, perception. So the potato, for example, has never been particularly expensive, but nobody would eat it in Europe, it was seen as, as almost kind of, people in um, in France, there was a, a law at one stage that, that you couldn't grow it or eat it because they thought it gave you leprosy. Um, and oh. something was something about it as knobbly, you know, it came from the Andes, it came from the deadly nightshade family. Mm -hmm. We hated it and it took a long time for it to filter down. And it's so its first kind of acceptance was in a very, was in, you know, it was made for these kind of, um, for the Sun King's court by Parmentier. And in Britain, it was then, accept, you know, it was, it was in sort of fairly aristocratic or kind of um, gentrified menus before it got down. There's a very nice quote from Jane Austen's mother was trying to persuade one of her tenants to grow potatoes and the tenant said, well, they're all very well for you gentry, but they must be terribly costly to rear. And she's just oh. going, no, I'm not going to have it. This is something for gentry. Um, and of course, it changes. So there's so much also in your book about the way we name things and what different things mean. I mean, about who has supper, who has dinner, who has tea. And, and what they mean in different setups and different parts of the country. So a lot of what, how you ate was to do with, obviously with your work. I mean, it seems to me if you were aristocratic, you could afford to have dinner late because it showed you weren't part of the manual classes, i.e. you didn't have to be up at six o'clock. So how did that all sort of move to where we now get these slightly absurd expressions like kitchen supper or country supper, or which you write about? Yes, yes. So if you start in the, if you start around Shakespeare's time, people were having dinner about noon, perhaps, and then they might have a supper later on, seven-ish, something like that. And within two or 300 years, dinner had moved about eight hours in the day. And it moved, like you say, because people are, it's a kind of, it's being chased up. It's being chased later and later. So people, if everybody is having dinner in midday, if the if your workers are having mid dinner at midday, you've got to show you've got to have it slightly later right. to show that you're different. And so then the middle class comes in. It's often it's often being driven by the middle class trying to kind of be aspiring to something that they see as more you know more kind of socially desirable. Um, 
so the, your merchant class or whoever, and it just gets pushed later and later and later. And um, so by the, I don't know, by the 10, by the, uh, so 1800, for example, you might've had dinner in the countryside at about three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon, but in the town, you might've had it about six o'clock. And so you, so country and town were very, very sort of identifying differences between people. And then uh, it gets pushed, and then supper and tea kind of jump over, jump over really, because you used to have your tea after dinner, and that'd be mm -hmm. another whole part of your evening that you'd uh, entertain people with. And then when supper gets later and later, uh, dinner gets later and later, there's no room for supper. And so at about 1840, tea starts to happen. We're talking right at the, you know, we're talking in people with a lot of leisure and a lot of money. Tea starts to happen in the middle of the afternoon because you're getting a bit peckish and you get a bit hungry. Um, and then supper might happen later. And so supper goes from being a meal that could be, belong to anybody. It be, starts to feel like a meal that's quite privileged in our about now you know it's it was really interesting there's that that thing isn't it when um rebecca uh brooks, brooks. when she was um editing the the news was, of the world yeah she was editing the times and she she'd written something rather unsupportive about david cameron and this came out in the leveson inquiry and she texted him and said oh we must discuss over country supper soon and in the Leveson, when it came out in the Leveson inquiry, people were completely horrified and they had a field day. And really, everybody said this is really terrible that, you know, a, you know, a Tory prime minister is in hock to this journalist. But really what they were interested in is that he was an eaten educated prime minister who knew how to do things properly. And he would have a kitchen supper, maybe, but he would never have a country supper. And it was a kind of neologism she sort of learnt it because she went to a comprehensive school in Warrington or something and that's what people were really interested in um the fact that she just got her language a bit long, long. you know like Eliza Doolittle at the yes. end of um uh um Pygmalion you know she says not bloody likely well no she's in the middle isn't it she says not bloody likely it's a kind of Eliza Doolittle moment and that's why everybody wants to kind of stick the needle in uh, so when did the the dinner party lose its kind of cachet and in a way become supper is now I mean to be invited for supper is now much nicer than the idea of a dinner party and and somehow that seems to have happened incredibly quickly I think it's probably come dine with me I, okay. I think so you see that where as soon as come dine with me becomes a kind of television spectacle and as soon as people start to think oh you know my kind of elegant dinner party is something that all these people who you know live in semi-detached houses or flats or you know you know haven't been to university or whatever it is however they're being viewed um as soon as they're adopting it then everybody else wants to move on and is that is it also true then that the, the whole way that say marks and spencers arrived and kind of produced all those meals that you know when shelly conran said life's too short to stuff a mushroom and in a way you could it was almost cool to decant the marks and sparks dinner and serve it up as something you'd cooked yeah yeah did that also accelerate the, the notion that this was a very old somehow old-fashioned or not intimate anymore i think so and i think you know now that we our perception is that the thing we don't have is time we all feel like you know there are something like eighty thousand lines in a tesco in a big tesco there's, we're not wow. short of choice uh, and if you've got a reasonable amount of money there's a huge amount of food that you can eat but we all feel that we don't have enough time to make it and so obviously anything that's been bought or you know grown or anything that's difficult to acquire or achieve has a lot more cachet for us. So that, is that why we're, we're so big on things that are local, things that come from farmers markets, these kind of ideas of going foraging? What's that trying to connect us back to? Well, I think, I think it is partly the idea of time, but it is partly also this idea that we know, it's, it's going back to this romantic idea of, you know, this 
class of kind of people, the romantic poets, they were poets, they were writers, they were intellectuals, you know, it's the kind of the Dr. Johnson class or um, who are kind of defining themselves against uh, a sort of aristocratic class, say, of landowners who can go off and, you know, who own land. That's their relationship to where their food comes from. They own it. Or defining themselves against, you know, people who live in the countryside and might work on the land, although there's mm -hmm. not that many people anymore. And so I think it's a, a sense to we want to reforge some kind of meaningful relationship with where our food comes from. And I think foraging is fascinating because I expected to find some really interesting accounts of how people living in villages, for example, used to forage. And they were so conspicuous by their absence. And I found that really interesting. And in foraging, we feel we're going back to mm -hmm. a kind of a way that our forefathers lived and our foremothers and the knowledge that they had whereas the and they probably did but the it's not something that's written about very much and i think probably because foraging for our forefathers and mothers was really what animals did you know when you had the enclosed before the yeah. enclosures you had common land you, they turned the available food on the common land into protein through their livestock. So if you had a cow or a pig, it would go and do that foraging, dig up all the nuts or whatever, mm -hmm. eat, you know, skillets, carrots. That's fascinating. And that's how you got your protein. And that's why the enclosures obviously were so kind of devastating yeah. to a whole, uh, you know, to generations and generations of people. But I think, and so foraging is a sort of, it's a recreation of something that never quite happened. But that's but really not fascinating. It's not great, you know, I just think it, it's we sometimes that make assumptions about the past that don't are, are probably not true. But um, like the Cornish pasty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, we've got lots of questions, and we're running out of time, and as ever. But um, I just wanted to ask you because it's so extraordinary. You know, we've all been a know about the Marcus Rashford campaign to get kids to have better food and something in your book that's just extraordinary I mean going back to 1900 when the army realized that the kids who were the young men the boys who were going to the pub the, the state schools were really suffering from malnourishment can you just tell us a little bit about that because it's so startling it's really startling isn't it so this is um the uh, Second Boer War, actually, so the, I think 1898 to 1902, and there was a difference of five inches between public and uh, state and privately educated boys. And it was one of the things that made the government of the time eventually think that they might have to do something about feeding children in education or generally, and it led to an act called the uh, uh, Ed Pro Education Provision of Meals Act, 1906, yeah. which made it not just, which made it legal and possible for the first time for local education authorities to provide free school meals, which means that before that, LEAs were not legally allowed to provide school meals because it was seen as it was it all goes back to the 1834 mm -hmm. poor law amendment mm -hmm. act where the idea is that you've got to only give charity in the workhouse situation otherwise yeah. you're going to spoil these horrible poor people you know they're just going to live off um live off the state and um and i think one of the things that was interesting is that a lot of charities in places like Bradford and Manchester just kind of went under the radar and, under, and just said, no, we are going to feed these kids because what's the point of educating kids yeah. if they're so hungry, they cannot learn and we're just going to feed them anyway. And I think um, one of the reasons for a long time we called school dinners, school dinners, even though a lot of people across the country have lunch if there's kids, it's because they, those charities came in from Bradford and Manchester and the whole idea of kind of school dinners came from the North where we tended to call dinner, uh, oh. the midday meal dinner. Okay, I, I always thought it was called that because it was sort of meant to be the one 
good meal of the day, which it is, of course, for yes. many kids. Yeah. But it was dinner somehow. Yes. And yes. the dinner think, lady came off it. Yeah, I think it is, but I think it is a slightly northern southern thing as That's well. Really interesting. And then now, of course, now in the latest stats, kids are starting to lose height again who are badly fed. It's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Um, on a more cheery note, though, Pen, so this is, a, as we started out talking, this is not our normal Christmas. Um, what to, what are you going to be eating and what are other suggestions to the, you know, the monster 25 pound turkey that you yeah. eat until March? Yeah, I'm going to have, um, well, I'm going to have a duck, actually, I hope, <laughs> uh, for Christmas and um, maybe also some venison because I have a very nice venison recipe from 1725 which says, which begins wow. with a piece of stag's flesh, S-A-S-T-A-G-G-S. And uh, it's just a completely delicious recipe with a bit of, with uh, capers and with lemon peel, oh, and white delicious. wine and mace. It's, it's quite unusual and really delicious. It's and very easy, weirdly easy. Um, but I do think there are lots of old, uh, there's loads of old recipes that we could, go back to I think spiced beef is a really fantastic boxing day tradition um there's one recipe there's one cook who calls it boeuf de la chasse or boeuf de chasse my French isn't very good meaning hunt, hunting beef because it's what you had on boxing day for the boxing day hunt and you have to make it it's a bit like um uh what's that stuff called that you it's pressed beef um um, oh. pastrami it's a bit like right. pastrami. you know you have to salt it for quite a long time with the spices in your fridge turn it every day cook it and then press it and you get this really amazingly delicious sort of very melting meat so that's a really good recipe and I think um there are there are things like making your own and you know if you've got the time making your own ham and gammon is a fantastic thing to do you have to kind of be confident about it you have to have a cool place you have to get a leg of pork and then you know put whatever spices or coca-cola if you're Ni nigella loss and you <laughs> want to make it but you know it really is a it can be a fantastic you know you could put it make it with apple juice or cider or mm -hmm. anything so I think spicing your own meat is actually a really special thing to do. Well, there is this fantastic recipe in your in your book um, about spiced beef, and it takes a couple of days to do, but it actually sounds so wonderful. So apart, as I said, apart from all the stories and things you'll find in Penn's book, you'll also find some great recipes. So we have lots and lots of really good questions coming in. Kevin Geddy says, do you think that television and the constant availability of food and cooking on TV has changed food and class with different ingredients, perhaps even programmes from different countries, or does it still divide in the way it perhaps did in previous centuries you talked about? I think the TV thing is really interesting, um, Kevin, because it gives people it gives people things to aspire to. And there was a whole thing recently, wasn't there, that people watched food, watched cooking on television more than they actually cooked themselves. And whether that's changed over lockdown and the pandemic, I don't know, actually. I think, I, I, I think TV programs are great. I don't think they have had the effect of making people feel that good food is something that's available to everybody. And I think this is one of the problems, um, and I'm not really an expert actually on, on watching on, you know, on kind of TV chefs, but I think one of the problems that we have in our conception of food in this country is that we feel that there is sort of an inevitability of a kind of food inequality, a kind of hierarchy. And so the TV chef foods, you know, where all that focus is on good, fresh ingredients grown local, you know, doing something quite chefy, quite pubby, quite gastro pubby, um, maybe being organic and all the rest of it. It's something that we aspire to, but it's something that we feel is kind of belongs to a certain section of the population. Mm -hmm. 
and the mass of food is not like that at all. The mass of food is, is mass produced and it's ultra processed and it's cheap and all the rest of it. And I think the problem we have is in our conception always of the more focus we put on food, on kind of aggrandizing food, the less, the more we're likely to take our focus away from thinking about what is good food, what mm -hmm. is available to everybody, can it scale out? And I think those are questions that should lie behind what we should be doing now. Um, and so, yes, it's wonderful that chefs, you know, go on television and share their skills. I, I think that, you know, that's great, but I, I think it's got to come it's only going to be effective if it comes with some kind of acknowledgement by a society, maybe in top down, and the government's got to get involved somehow, although that's Rosie's area of knowledge, not mine, about how that becomes available to everybody. It seems to me when I watch things like MasterChef, which, which seems to be on every single day at the moment, rather extraordinarily, that the, the food is, it's just entertainment. I mean, most of the food that they cook is so complicated you sort of look at it and then you think, oh, actually, I'll make shepherd's pie. Yeah. <laughs> that, that that's what you, you know, that that's what you re you return to. And so it's a, it's made food something, well, let's say it's, it's very odd that it should be this strange competitive entertainment. And you wonder how many people actually go and cook these very, very complex things. Yeah, yeah. I do think it is difficult. I do think, um, I think we went wrong in the, so for example, a, a parallel, would be in the 19th century. We became so obsessed by French food. Everything had to be French. So if you were, you know, if you were, had any kind of money or status whatsoever, you had, you, you mm. ate French food either in a restaurant, if you had a French chef, that was even better. Um, and I just think that it took away the focus on British food. And so all that stuff about British food being terrible, you know, in the early years of the 20th century, right up to the kind of time it got kind of rescued, I suppose, in the, in the 1980s. A lot of that comes from this idea that we were just so focused on French food. And I think it's, and, and again, I think that the focus was just wrong. We were just asking ourselves the wrong questions. And what we should have been doing is thinking about actually not what is good food for a few people, but what is available and good food for it for yes i think i think that's right but i mean now if you look at what people eat i mean that the i mean because we're such a rich multicultural society i mean british food it may be what gets talked about on masterchef but in fact in reality there's just as much indian and ethnic and different different cuisines aren't there i think we've learned a huge amount from indian and ethnic cuisine I and mean, indian restaurants are fascinating aren't they because for many people in this country going to an indian restaurant and being treated you know with napkins and mm. you know a waiter wearing black and a black waistcoat and all that stuff was probably the first time they'd been sort of treated respectfully i suppose you know in a in a restaurant and we've and we whatever the rights and wrongs of kind of the way you know the the kind of anglic anglicization of indian food and how that's come about i do think we owe a huge debt to um you know to, to indian particularly i think but also other ethnic foods in terms of the concept of kind of availability and the concept of you know a kind of general aspiration that this is something that everybody can aspire to um, we've got a couple of questions that are slightly linked. Um, one from Joe McDowell. Do you think that the increasingly smaller families, growing levels of isolation and the rising levels of vegetarianism will see the end of Christmas? And then another question on the same sort of lines from Jean Dubosc. Um, what extent do you think vegetarianism is seen as a class related practice? I think um, we'll start with Joe's question about will it send the end of Christmas? I don't think it will spell the end of Christmas. I think if you go back to that, um, that rather to our minds, rather hilarious quote from uh, the the Puritan news sheet, you know, when they're trying to sort of ban 
the, the poor, you know, from eating kind of Christmas food. I think we, we need Christmas as a kind of punctuation point in our year. Um, there's a fantastic quote from George Orwell, for example, and he says, uh, again, about, about the food that poor people reach for and they reach for, you know, a, some chips or a sweet cup of tea or, you know, some white bread and butter or whatever it is, because they're cheap and they're easy to eat mm -hmm. and give you an instant lift. And you think, well, if you need that instant lift in the day, how much more do we all need an instant lift, you know, in on the 25th of December? And so I think, you know, people will just get their instant lift from kind of different kind of vegetarian foods. But the, um, is it Jean's question about, uh, about class and vegetarian? Mm. I think that the history of vegetarianism is really, really interesting because the first vegetarians for many decades, possibly even centuries, there was this concept that being a vegetarian was something you did to improve yourself if you were probably a working man. Um, and so the first vegetarian in the, or vegetarians who called themselves Pythagoreans or were called Pythagoreans in the 17th century. Um, the first vegetarian cookbook was written by this man who's dad was a tiler I think and you know he, he's very much kind of artisan or be kind of below artisan class and he saw it as a way of becoming more kind of spiritually pure more moral and therefore better and therefore improving yourself you know in this very kind of combined way um, in society and I think what's interesting is that we've kept some of those ideas about kind of moral improvement, mm. uh, but now it's in relationship to our kind of treatment of animals and things. But historically, right up to George, you know, right up to kind of just before George Bernard Shaw, who I wouldn't put in this category, but people were trying to say vegetarianism is something that the working man should adopt. It is good for him. He can still dig up roads and do whatever he needs to do with this diet. And it was just, it, it seems extraordinary to us now because we now know that vegetarianism has been picked up because it's been adopted by celebrities and women. And actually that they're more, far more influential in terms of the way that we eat than uh, working, you know, so workmen are not necessarily the people who kind of dictate you know who who are the kind they're not really trendsetters in dietary terms anyway women have always had in a lot of women in the household and then sort of chefs you know have always had much more kind of influence in what we eat okay so so i've got all sorts of other questions there's a quick one here how should you pronounce well i'm going to say scone oh scone is it scone or scone or scone so uh <laughs> Did a poll. Thank you for the question, Catherine. Mm? You, sorry, YouGov did a poll about how right. to pronounce scone in 2016. So if you are from the Mid Midlands or you are B, C, D, E, I think, or if there is such a class, if you're- Oh, those acorn classifications. Yeah, in that kind of, you know, socioeconomic classification, you will say scone. If you're from the North, uh, or from the ABC, class, you know, socioeconomic uh, classification, you will say scone. And what will they say in the crown? Oh, in the crown? I've no idea, actually. They could say both because they have north and south. Oh, well, if they... Well, I mean, what would the Queen say? Well, she should say scone. Okay, okay. You know, a very nice, nice... Um, contribution here from Katrina Patterson saying as my mother was a nurse she never learned to cook but she was always cooked for in the old days of the NHS which I do particularly like so what does um and a nice comment here from Teresa Sherpas too being a chef has huge status it never had before and so many of the contestants in MasterChef are not from posh background absolutely mm. but they make very fancy food that must be inspirational to all classes is her point there which I think is probably true um, someone, Jane Southering, wants to know where you can find a venison recipe with lemon and capers. Have you got it in your book? It's in my, it's not in Scoff, it's in my Jane Austen book. And um, then this, 
very interesting question from someone whose name is hard to a broom fee um saying it was used to be bad form for respectable people to talk about or take a great deal of interest in food i mean i suppose because that sort of made you sound like you were frightfully greedy or something and now it's become incredibly acceptable to go out to dinner or go out to supper and end up talking about food and that's quite that is a big change i'm i can recognize that in my lifetime i mean when i was a kid you just kind of ate it and you you were meant to talk about something else at the dinner table yeah we were we were actually banned from talking about food my dad hated it my mum my mum produced these amazingly delicious meals every you know day for a family of six and my dad hated talking about food so we just never did but I think that is true I think there are so many things that people of my generation kind of inherited from their parents you know like not having a ketchup bottle or a milk bottle on the table or something. And yeah. then for the generation before me, or it would be eating in the street. Um, right. And then, yes, I think you're right. Talking about food is one of them. And I think in our generation, there's a, or the, or the kind of young generation, there's a, there's a, there's a slightly different concept of kind of what, what Pierre Bourdieu would call cultural capital. So, the idea now is um, and so so young, some younger people have said to me that class is just not a thing for me and my that you know me and my friends we just don't think it is a thing like it was for you and your you know in your parents but i think it is it, I, I think it, it is a thing but it's much more acceptable to kind of choose different elements of things which have kind of class associations and be confident about them. So I think a lot of thing about talking about food now is because we are confident enough in our own cultural capital to just decide to do what we want to do at the table. You know, so if I eat my salad in a restaurant with my fingers, it's not because I was brought up in the gutter, it's because I'm confident enough that I don't care-ish, you know, about what other people say to me because I know that I'm not going to blow my nose on the tablecloth you know I know what rules I can and can't break and I think do you, about food is do, one you have dif do you have any different rules do you think from your parents um <laughs> my mum's probably watching this so <laughs> I, mean, I mean like all of us uh I find my mum you know I channel my mum Every time I pour milk into a milk jug, I'm channeling my mum, I feel. Um, no, I think I was incredibly lucky, you know, when people complain about food in the 70s in this country, that it was all just really, you know, dishwasher, you know, soup and kind of grey mints and stuff. I never had it, any of that experience, you know. I think I was incredibly lucky because um, my mum just put, did cook us really nice, very kind of wholesome, really delicious meals so I probably have been influenced by her more than I kind of recognize <laughs> actually. Um, so uh, finally what would be um, any thoughts that you should have that people should take away for, for this crisp for this strange Christmas I mean is there one thing that uh, if we're not all going to be leveled up by the turkey what can we be leveled up by thinking about and eating on Christmas day um, I think, I do think the turkey, I mean, I've, I've come a long way, I think, in my kind of turkey appreciation, because I do realise now that in those kind of early, you know, trying to kind of not have the turkey along with everybody else, and it is partly because it's kind of, you know, a bit dull tasting, um, that there, there's a kind of element of food snobbery in me. Uh, you know, because because of that, because I didn't want to eat what everybody else was eating. And um, in the same way that in writing this book, I realised I had this terrible food snobbery about cans. I just didn't have food in cans. And now I think that's actually pointless. You know, food in tins is perfectly reasonable. And um, so I think we should, what could we take away? I mean, I think an awareness of where our tastes come from is really helpful. It's really helped me in figuring out, you know, what is my personal taste and what is, how much is kind of molded mm. by, by my environment and by, you know, 
my peers and by everything I read and by what's happened in the past. And I think the and I think the Turkey thing is very it's actually quite hopeful because one of the things I know inevitably I'm looking at a thousand years in my book and the, the amount of change has been absolutely huge you know if you look at the change in avocado consumption or the way that tripe has gone mm. from being quite you know prestigious fit meal to being just below the you know beyond the pale you know there's been a huge numbers in the technolo technological changes and mm -hmm. the foods coming in there's a huge amounts of change and so I suppose if we think that we can have this Christmas dinner where we are all kind of aspiring to the same thing for one day, then maybe we can do it more. You know, maybe that's not an impossible aspiration to have, that we all actually aspire for us all to have kind of good food, you know, that is good for everybody. So I guess that's my, my positive and optimistic outlook. Thank you. Thank you, Penn. Thank you so much. That was just the most enjoyable hour, I think, that is imaginable. And I think everyone will have enjoyed it. And thank you. We've had lots of people online. We've got lots more questions. And I'm sorry that we haven't been able to get to them all because they were all actually really, really good questions. So all I can do is say thank you all to 5 by 15 listeners everywhere. Thank you so much for your support through this strange year and I hope that you've enjoyed being with us we've certainly enjoyed being with you and you know there's been lots of downsides but on the other hand there have been lots of upsides to being able to broadcast virtually and to appear in your living rooms and for people to have joined us from all over the world um, thank you thank you very much for your support because we wouldn't be here without it um, we'll be back in January, and uh, I know that early on in January, we've got the wonderful Douglas Stewart, author of the Booker Prize winning Shaggy Bane, which is also a fantastic book. But as a top Christmas present, I cannot recommend Scoff too much for really whoever it is that you want to buy a book for, because there is something in it for everybody, including the recipe for the spiced beef, which uh, given that we all look like we're going into another lockdown, it's probably quite a good idea to get going on it right now. So um, I'd like to wish you all a really happy Christmas, um, a happy new year. Please stay safe. I hope wherever you are, it's all going to be okay and you manage to get lots of good works, walks and outside stuff. Um, and for those of you who want to hear more of Penn, she'll be on Women's Art tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And thank you all very, very much indeed. And we'll see you again soon. And once again, have a really happy Christmas and a happy new year and look after yourselves. Good night. Thanks, Rosie. Thank you, Penn. <laughs>